We are now live to YouTube. We are now live to Shah. Also, welcome, bienvenue, Anine. I'd like to thank our media and broadcast partners who are covering tonight's meeting. And I'd also like to begin the meeting by acknowledging with respect that we are in Robinson here on treaty territory, that the land on which we are gathered is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and known as Bawating. Bawating is home to Garden River First Nation, Batchewana First Nation, and the historic Sault Ste. Marie Métis Council. Madam Clerk. Agenda item two, adoption of minutes. I have a motion by Councillors Caputo and Hollingsworth resolved that the minutes of special meeting of City Council dated February 20th, 2024 and regular council meeting of February 20th, 2024 be approved. All in favor. Before we uh, get into the approval of the agenda, agenda sorry, there's a couple things I wanted to note off the top. First off, uh, as many of you may have read, we lost uh, a former city clerk, longtime city clerk, Bill Lindsay, over uh, the last uh, week. And uh, Bill was a uh, dedicated City of Sault Ste. Marie employee for many years, a dedicated uh, Suite and a passionate Suite, uh, and uh, contributed much, not just to the city, but to the community at large over uh, many years of both his public service and his service uh, to the community outside of uh, the walls of this uh, this council chambers. We also uh, lost uh, Lou Madonna, former mayor and uh, Reeve of uh, Prince Township, longtime mayor and Reeve of Prince Township and longtime uh, merchant in the Station Mall. He was known to many and uh, was also a great uh, community member and uh, a great advocate for the area. So uh, our condolences to both the uh, Lindsay and Madonna families. And then of course, as many of you around the table will know, uh, we all collectively breathed a great sigh of relief on the weekend uh, or, or late last week hearing 
of the uh, success of Kylie Provenzano's uh, tumor re removal. Uh, and uh, she is a great friend of many of ours in uh, around this council table. And she is a great advocate for uh, brain cancer research. And uh, we wish her all the best uh, from our, the entire community for a successful recovery. Uh, and uh, if you are able to, I encourage all community members to donate to Brain Cancer Canada at braincancercanada.ca slash donate. And that would uh, help others hopefully achieve a similarly successful outcome to that that Kylie uh, experienced uh, late last week. So get well soon, Kylie. Madam Clerk. Agenda item four, declarations of pecuniary interest. I've not received any. Seeing none. Agenda item five, approve agenda as presented. I have a motion uh, by Councillors Caputo and Spina resolved that the agenda and addendum number one for March 18, 2024 City Council meeting as presented be approved. All in favor. That carries. And that'll move us into planning. And first planning item, A1323 ZOP 1050 Great Northern Road Amendment Report. Mr. Tenazzo, I report's fairly brief, but if you could give us a even more brief crazy of it. Thank you, Mayor Shoemaker. Council approved this application in principle uh, on its February 20th meeting. The planning report had a small typo uh, in, in the recommendation, which referenced the incorrect current zoning. Uh, this report clarifies the actual existing zoning and the implementing bylaws are located elsewhere on Council's agenda uh, and are recommended for approval. Thank you. Council, any questions? Anybody here to speak in favor or in opposition of this Great Northern Road report? Seeing none, all in favor? Oh, yes, you have the motion. That would help. I have a motion by Councillors Caputo and Hollingsworth resolved that the report of the junior planner dated March 18, 2024, concerning application A13 23 Z.OP be received as information. And there's two relevant bylaws that will be read under agenda item 12. And it's open for voting. All in favor. That carries. That will bring us to agenda item 8.7.2, A-3-24-Z 105 Allard Street for Allard Susi or SSM Inc. Uh, Mr. Tenazzo. Thank you, Mayor Shoemaker. The subject property is formerly home to the local Red Cross office. It's located on the west side of Allard Street, uh, about 100 meters north of its intersection with Chapel Avenue. Uh, the existing zoning permits the proposed five-story apartment building. Uh, however, in this case, the applicant is seeking a number of minor setback reductions uh, and a fairly sizable uh, required parking reduction from 59 uh, spaces to 37 spaces. Given the character of the area and the site's location, which is in close proximity to a wide variety of commercial uh, and community services and amenities, uh, planning staff is of the opinion uh, that the requested variances are appropriate and recommend approval of the application. Uh, the applicant, Matthew Moxness, I believe is here via Zoom uh, to speak to this application should council have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tenazzo. Uh, Council, I trust that there are uh, several questions on this. I um, have seen some uh, across the email chains over the weekend. Um, the applicant is uh, fairly well known to uh, many of us in the community uh, for the uh, derelict state of many properties uh, that uh, are owned by companies in which he's involved. Uh, that is not what's before Council. And so while I like uh, many of you have been vocal and uh, would like to tee off on poor property standards uh, that are uh, prevalent throughout our community on properties owned by uh, this applicant. That is not what is before us. And uh, the questions, generally speaking, should be limited to uh, the application that is before us. I think that there is a need and a time and a place for um, um questions on uh, the property standards uh, bylaw and the compliance with it by the applicants, uh, other holdings. 
uh, as well as those of well-known out-of-town landlords like Mr. Ferrari. Uh, but I don't think that we have uh, the jurisdiction to deny this application. In fact, I'm sure we don't have the jurisdiction based on the responses I've seen um, from uh, the legal department this weekend uh, to deny this application based on other um, uh, failures to comply with bylaws by this app. So uh, with uh, that preface, I will open it up to questions. I believe Councillor Dufour and Councillor Bruni I had on my list. Okay, so we'll go to Councillor Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple questions to Mr. Tanazo regarding the parking, the reduced spaces from 59 to 37, uh, and the ratio was cut from 1.25 to 0.79. Um, would this be enough parking spaces for the 47 apartment? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bruni, as the report notes, so we've we're looking at parking reform, and, and ultimately, yeah, this is a change for us, right? So, um, we're of the opinion that in this particular area it would be enough. We have done some on-site investigation. We have been looking at other parking bylaws throughout Ontario and the world, for that matter, or North America, and really, there there's a movement to try to as it, when it comes to especially residential parking. Residential parking adds a lot of cost. It reduces density. Um, there, there, there's a, a movement to try to, in some cases, disassociate parking with the development. So what that means is it, it allows for more units and it allows uh, residents to make a choice, right? It, if, if you have a parking spot for me, I'm willing to pay extra for it, for example, and, and I'll take the unit. If you don't have a parking spot for me, I'll, either I'll move on uh, or, or I'll get rid of my car. Um, so really what it does is it is it creates a lot more flexibility in 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 the space and it, it it really does work in an area that is well served by transit and has pedestrian access to all the services that one would need that, that this area has. So what happens if there's more than 37 vehicles? For you, Mr. Mayor, I I think at that point the tenants have to make a decision because you can't park on the road for a good chunk of the year. So it's leaving it up to individuals to make that decision. Essentially what we're doing is we're prioritizing housing over a spot, uh, a, pla a place for you to have, you know, a place to have a roof over your head as opposed to a place for your vehicle. If this is passed tonight, can we put in certain mandates regarding when this project should be finished? Like if he wants to tear down the building and he wants to build a five-story, can we put things in place that it has to be completed by a certain time? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bruni, I'm not aware of of any way through the Planning Act that we can we can put time frames on a, on a rezoning, uh, you know, within the con context of a rezoning application. Okay, so. Pass it. He could be sitting there, sitting for the next ten years. Because if he's not going to move on it, that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about if we pass it tonight and there's no activity on that piece of property. But through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bruni, that that's the case. And I can think of a number of rezonings that that I've worked over my twenty my twenty years here uh, that that haven't materialized as well. That's just part of the way that it goes sometimes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Bruni. Councilor Vezo Allen. Thank you. Um, through you, Mayor, to Mr. Moxness. I just have a question in terms of the 47 units, such as the mix. Are they going to be for empty nesters? Like, are they one bedroom, two bedroom, or are they three bedroom? I'm just wondering what the composition is of the opposed, opposed, um, proposed apartments, if he's online. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I don't see him on Zoom. Hello? He's online. Okay. Hello. Oh, there we go. Hello, everybody. Um, as it stands, it would be approximately one uh, for one bedrooms would be about uh, uh, 10. Uh, there'd be about uh, maybe 15 one plus dens and about 20 to 25 two bedrooms. So they are geared more towards uh, economical housing. 
Um, it's geared partially towards students, um, which also speaks to the parking comments uh, originally discussed. And in the rationale for that mix, uh, Mr. Moxness, how many units are going to be barrier free, if any? Um, I believe the current, so we haven't got uh, too far along in the design, um, but from what I see on each floor, it looks like there'd be two barrier freeze. And those would be the one plus a den, presumably? Correct. Correct. Uh, it actually, it looks like it's this particular layout would be one two bedroom and one bedroom and one one bedroom one. And with it being five stories, is an elevator going to be installed? Um, at this time, because if you're doing barrier free, then then right. presumably someone can't do the stairs. Right. At this time, there's two staircases and one elevator. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No further questions. Councilor, are there other questions? Councilor, uh, I see there's residents with comments. Well, we'll get to you. Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess my first question. Um, so <clears throat> uh, with all due respect to your comments, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I do feel uh, a significant need to say something about the character of the applicant and the character of other properties that they own in the city. Um, and, and I just want to take one minute here to explain my rationale. Um, for the last five years, I sat as a city councillor here. I've done a lot of work through the building department, uh, the bylaw enforcement department. I've chaired task forces, um, and I've significantly led a charge to resource our legal and bylaw department in order to affect the kinds of changes that we need in Sault Ste. Marie to have safe and affordable quality housing here. And over that time, uh, there have been several companies that have been perpetual and repeat offenders to not just property standards, but to a standard of care that each and every one of us would expect from any living dwelling uh, in our country. And at every point in this process, uh, I have come to realize that the level of provincial jurisdiction that is provided to municipalities to enforce these bylaws is very little. We have precious little authority in order to affect the kind of changes that our community expects of us when it comes to property standards. And so it's in this context where we do have a jurisdiction and a say over land use planning um, that I feel the need to examine character in some fashion. Um, that said, uh, I do think that it's important for the community to hear from our city legal department on just exactly what our ability is to deny rezoning based on the character of the owner. So Ms. Fields, would you be willing to comment on that for me, please? Through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Dufour. Um, as council is sitting in the planning uh, part of the agenda, they have to adjudicate uh, the matters that come before them in a fairly, um, in a fair and open-minded manner on the issues that are directly before them not the issues that they may know about a person or the issues that deal with other properties, but the issues that are before them on this event. And if we don't, Ms. Fields, then what? If we don't, we open ourselves up to the decision being appealed on the basis of not being fair and open-minded or being biased. And... Sorry, Councilor Dufour, but would, would such uh, appeal have real consequences for the city other than simply delaying the applicant's eventual approval? There are consequences in the sense that the appeal leads to having to go to a hearing. So it's the preparation time, uh, taking people away from their regular work to attend at these hearings. Uh, being before an adjudicator, there are not large consequences usually for um Following through on an appeal, it's everybody's right to have an appeal if they feel it's strongly enough. However, if there are cases that are made on, based on bad faith, you might invite the tribunal to send a message to counsel. Which would be what? What type of message? 
a cost consequences message. So they would allow the appeal if they felt it was made in bad faith and they could have a monetary award against the city. Okay. Yeah, um, just follow up that question, Ms. Fields. What, when we talk about bad faith, what kinds of judgments would the tribunal, like, can you give an example of where a tribunal, uh, the OLT, found bad faith uh, in a council or a body? There are a couple of cases where uh, the decisions that were made were based on uh, items that were not before um, council, so things that they knew about the person that was bringing the application. They were based on um, not things that were brought by the planning department or the recommendations of the planning department. Further questions, Council? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask Mr. Boxness if he has anything to say for himself. Um, I guess so. In in general, in in in, um, I think we're we're somewhat being um, bundled in a in a group of people. I know you mentioned uh, Italo Ferrari earlier, uh, an individual that I don't know. Um, I know that there's other trouble that's uh, happening in general in the. Um, uh, in the market that has nothing to do with myself or the people I'm associated with in general. Um, it may appear a certain way, but we do mean well in general in town. Um, <clears throat> we've taken on certain challenges, and I don't think anybody can deny that certain areas in town have challenges in terms of homelessness, uh, drugs, and other issues. And that's really what all I'll say. Thank you for addressing that. Councillor Gardy. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to uh, Mr. Uh, Oxness, the gentleman's name. Um, just something that you said uh, just kind of sparked something in my uh, head. <laughs> so I think in response a few moments ago to Councillor Dufour, that you know you think you said you guys mean well, quote you mean well in general close quotes. Well, we need people who. We want people who mean well specifically. And um, words here carefully. Um, I think it important that we embrace developers and development who are committed to remedying the concerns that um, you kind of flippantly brought forward a few seconds ago. Um, we have some challenges that many people in our community are trying to uh, overcome. Uh, we're doing it collectively and we need partners in good faith who are willing to uh, pursue that with us. Um, I'm hopeful that um, you and your developing com developer companies or co colleagues, I should say, uh, as it relates to this um, piece of property are, uh, Going to pursue that in um, that vein, um, but I really don't like, Mr. Mayor, when people from outside of our community who don't necessarily have the best track record with our community cast the aspersions that there are a lot of bad things going on in a number of neighborhoods in our community. Um, we're looking for partners to help us overcome those challenges. Thanks. Councillor Thank Gardy. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm going to, Councillor Knox do for, uh, asked for a follow-up as well. I'm going to give you one follow-up as well after that, Councillor Bruni. Councillor as well, and if you had a follow-up, you're okay. And then I'll, I'll go to Councillor uh, Hollingsworth first, since she is not asking follow-up, but initial questions. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, to um, the applicant. Based on what you have just heard over the last few minutes, what can you tell us that will re, will basically reinforce that you will be a contributor, a positive contributor to the community? What can you basically do to guarantee that you will hear the concerns of the community and be able to execute in the best manner. 
Um, and, and just to go back one second, just while I'm speaking, I didn't mean to insult anybody by any of the comments that I made about certain challenges in the city. That's not my intention either. Um, although I can't guarantee anything, uh, I don't think anybody can. Uh, in, in general, uh, certain properties that, that we own, there's some in better areas, there's some in areas that do have challenges, uh, in particular, perhaps the downtown core for some of them. And what they were before we took over were far worse than they than they are now. And there's some cases where that takes time, like in the downtown area, where we've been getting broken into every night. So we have our local uh, contractors and staff that attend every day. We may board a property up. We may try to renovate inside. But then next thing you know, it's been completely run, um, run over uh, overnight. So we may clean the inside, we may clean the outside. And then this actually happened, I brought this up to bylaw, um, where certain people in town brought garbage bins from various addresses throughout the city and dragged them onto our property. And that was the day after they were just, they were just clean. So while many of the bylaw concerns are correct, some may not be 100% factual in that we're not making an effort to to keep the city clean and to keep our properties clean, we are in fact trying very hard. It's just in many cases, it's difficult. Um, that particular property is beside a, uh, I believe it's some sort of um, uh, shelter uh, where people go to get soup and so on. And um, I, I, that particular property is is definitely challenging, but our intent is to uh, uh, fix it up and 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 put good people in there it's just I just don't think anybody can deny that these that there are these challenges in those in those areas. Um, so that's a long winded to say long winded way to say I can't guarantee anything, but my intention is one hundred percent there. Uh, we 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 spent millions of dollars in the city uh, already renovating, uh, and that's in nice areas and in bad areas, and we are in fact trying to improve uh, across the board, um, although it may not seem that way in some instances. Go ahead, Councillor Hollingsworth. Just let's, uh, I guess, more specifically, Mr. Mox, knows, let's try and kind of generally speaking, uh, keep responses to the degree possible, depending on what the question is to the application that is before us. Sorry. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, the questions are kind of uh, uh, a little bit off topic as well, although I understand the place. That come from. Um, through you, Mayor, for this particular project, you must have a plan with some key deadlines. Are you able to share with us deadlines, even though our planning department didn't have the deadlines for completion? Sorry, is that directed to me? Yes. Sorry, yes, to the applicant. Apologies. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to be very specific because it's we've, we've purchased this this property um, about a year, a year and a half ago, and we're we're at this stage now. Um, but we actually wanted to break ground uh, this summer, which, of course, couldn't happen now. Um, we're looking at different uh, construction materials uh, and uh, uh, what the best path would would be to, to to develop the site. And that just wouldn't be possible this summer. So I think at this point, uh, we'd likely be into the spring uh, of next year, um, but we'd, we're we're looking to move as quickly as we can. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Hollingsworth. Councillor Spina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not sure who I would direct my first question to. Perhaps, maybe Mr. Tenazzo, I'm not sure. Uh, do we know what the current population density in that area is? Through you, Mayor Shoemaker, I I don't I don't have that specific other than to say that we know that this is probably the highest densely populated populated area of the community outside of some smaller pockets in the downtown. So it is a very high density. Yeah. Okay. Area. Uh, fair enough. And then, yeah, I don't think I was expecting an exact number, but yeah, this is uh, fair to say this is probably the most, if not the most dense densely populated area in town. Through you, Mr. Mayor, outside of some very small sure. pockets in the downtown, yes, that's that's a true statement. Okay, um, so with that uh, density, adding these units there, uh, and specifically, I'm thinking of reducing the number of, this is a 
very significant reduction in the number of parking spaces. Uh, my concern I share with uh, Councillor Bruni, what's going to happen with a lot of these vehicles? People may say, you know, I, I don't have a vehicle today, but tomorrow they do. We see specifically, I have seen in this area, because it is densely populated and parking is at a premium, the vehicles are on the roadway, which of course interferes with snow removal. And of course, because it is so densely populated, we run the risk of children and other elderly individuals walking in areas. And uh, I, I have a real concern with removing all of the parking from this site and yet allowing all of that pedestrian traffic in a, the most densely populated area in town to be kind of meandering about at the same area where we're going to have vehicles in conflict with pedestrians. Uh, is there anything that can be done to mitigate that risk or uh, is the plan the plan with these parking spots and that's it? Uh, through you, Mayor Shoemaker, to, to Councillor Spina. Uh, again, we're prioritizing housing over the parking of vehicles. And, and, and the thinking behind this is that a lot of people that live in this area don't drive. We we did, a, I'm not gonna call it a scientific review, but we're anywhere from 0.4 to 0.8 in terms of the, the block of, of apartments to the east of this area. It's anywhere from 0.4 to 0.8 vehicles per unit. The applicant, the, the resulting ratio is 0.79. Mm -hmm. So we're of the opinion that based upon the character of that area, that, that this 0.79 will actually accommodate the vehicle or the, the parking demand for the area. As far as parking spilling out over onto the road, again, we do have on-street parking in areas where it is permitted and it does work with pedestrians and it does work in far more densely populated uh, communities where you have on-street parking and pedestrians. What we, what we do have is, is a winter uh, where the on-street parking doesn't work. And at that point, it's going to be an enforcement problem uh, and an enforcement issue that I think we can we can accommodate and we can enforce it. And at the end of the day, if somebody's getting a ticket every night, they're going to have to make a decision about where they live or whether they own a vehicle or not. And I would love to come back to council in three or four years with a healthier vacancy rate, but a big parking problem. And I would love the opportunity to come back to council at some point to to, to solve some parking issues. So did that, uh, and I recognize it's not an, uh, a scientific study, did that study account for the fact that because these people aren't driving, there'd be an increase in motor vehicle traffic due to delivery services and other kinds of services coming into the area because they don't drive? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, yeah, I, I think you would see an increase in, in certain delivery vehicle services, but I think the road, Allard Street, can handle that. Whether there's on-street parking on it or not, I, I think it's... You know, when you look at the site plan, it's it's well there. There's good access into the site. I I, I think it can handle the increase that will come about from this uh, five story apartment building. Okay, uh, and I'm not sure what the infrastructure is in that area, but the infrastructure I'm assuming can handle the additional units, the sewers, the electrical, everything that's there. Of course, there'll have to be something added, but the current infrastructure won't be overloaded. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Spina, so as part of the circulation process, PUC engineering would be circulated as it relates to stormwater, sanitary sewer, water services. No red flags have been raised. Uh, it, it would appear that the downstream capacity can handle this, uh, but there is certainly the site plan control process that this uh, application or this development will go through, uh, which will be a, a, a much deeper dive into that. But at this point, there doesn't seem to be any um, capacity issues with the infrastructure. Okay. Uh, and uh, to uh, to the applicant, Mr. Mayor, through you to the applicant, um, how many units do you intend to, to build? Uh, we're hoping for about 46 or 47. Okay. Um, those are all my questions, Mr. Mayor. Just I have a genuine concern over the uh, infrastructure for this plan, and as a result, I don't think I can support it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Spina. Um, Councillor Dufour and then Brady. One, one follow-up or one question. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I had one additional question. Um, through you to the fire chief, are there other properties owned by these corporations that have outstanding uh, orders from the fire department uh, in Sault Ste. Marie right now? I think that's probably outside of the scope of this rezoning uh, Fire Chief uh, Johnson, although I suspect the answer is yes. It is. Okay. Um, Councillor Bruni. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Hollingsworth asked a question regarding when it would be a start date and maybe a completion date. And I don't think Mr. 
Moxness was clear enough, so maybe he can re, um, return the same reply, I guess, for a better understanding. Uh, yeah, at, th at this at this stage, I believe we would start in the assuming everything were, were to go forward. I believe we would start in the spring, um, and and uh, uh, yeah, the the spring, and and then um, uh, uh, sorry, next next spring. Apologies. Um, and uh, uh, we would go through uh, that spring and summer uh, and into the fall for development. Um, and again, this is dependent on on what our um, uh, construction material choice is. Uh, I know that if we do a, a precast option, uh, that can be faster. Uh, if we choose other options, it, it may take a little bit more time, uh, but that would be our goal at this at this stage. And um, if we can do that, do anything faster, we would we would definitely prefer uh, to begin faster. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Councilor Vezuel, and I'll go to you as well for one more question. As I change the rules after uh, you had already spoke. Thank you. It was after um, understanding the timeline. Um, this question would be for Mr. Moxis. Mr. Moxis, what is your plan to keep the uh, current building that was the Red Cross facility um, secure since you're not going to be doing any um, activity on the building until next spring? If everything gets approved, uh, we we could take it down. We, we had already uh, thought about doing that. Um, and uh, uh, just in relation to generally people breaking in and so on, although that's a one of the, I guess, the stronger, a better area, um, we, we'd probably take it down. I think that might be prudent for, for everybody. So if this is approved, the next plan is that you're going to be doing demolition. Have you started the planning for that? Not not yet, but I believe we we would move forward with that, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bezoan. We've got residents. Are we? Do we have any speaking in favor of the application? We've got some here to speak in opposition to the application. It looks like so. You can state your name and address and uh, make any comments you wish. Yeah, at the at the microphone. It's not a time for questions, just to be clear, but only comments on. Oh, the next uh, microphone uh, beside there. Yeah. Hello, Council. How are you? Um. So I have a kind of a unique perspective. Sorry. I name, manage name and address. Oh, sorry, Elissa like, Turk, Pine Ellard Properties Manager. I live at 135 Parkland Crescent, though. Thank you. Um, so I manage the four buildings on two on Pine, two on Allard Street. So we have 200 units within those four buildings. Uh, our buildings were made in 1962, 1963. So those buildings at the time, the parking lots were not required to have as many parking spaces as there were units at that time. Uh, we have noticed over the years, um, there's always a struggle of balancing tenants that do need parking, tenants that don't need parking, tenants that need more than one parking spot. Um, and then as well, over the past couple of years, we had our parking removed on Pine Street for the bike lanes. With that, we did have to put in two visitor parking spots for each of our buildings. We also have contractors that are on site on a daily basis, which you need parking for as well. Um, so I really don't believe that they have enough parking with the number of units that they have. Like, like I said, there are some tenants that don't require parking, but we're finding more and more as the years go past that more and more tenants are either having a vehicle or having two vehicles even in a tenant unit. So if you have yourself and a roommate or two spouses, most of the times tenants are now requiring at least one parking spot. Um, so with that, you know, that, that's definitely a concern. Um, we have also concerns with snowplow. Uh, for us, what we do for snowplow is we do have all of our tenants take their vehicles out of the parking lot and they have to line up on the street. It's a juggling all, every time you do snowplow. If one of the other buildings in that area also needs to do snowplow and have vehicles out there, we have issues with tenants that have uh, guests um, that park on the street as well. They get tickets and things like that. So parking is definitely a concern for us all the time. Um, and if they add 
that building and not have enough parking, then he'll have these people trying to park on our lots as well in some of our tenant spots. And they do pay for their parking spot. It's always a struggle with us for people that are parking in other tenants' parking spots. We do have the ability to give uh, city tickets and we do, but it happens with the number of buildings that we have around and number of tenants that we have. Uh, so that's definitely a concern. And uh, like Councillor Spina had spoken, also a concern of infrastructure. And if it hasn't been already evaluated, um, what that will entail of having to update sewer systems, electrical, that type of things, will it affect our taxes? Um, will it be major construction where they're having to deal with that roadway to update sewer systems and such. Um, we've had several plumbing issues in our buildings where we've had to deal with the, our sewers, um, you know, just due to breakdown of, of fabric containment of our sewer pipes and such. So definitely a concern there. Um, our main concerns are this, those two things, like it's going to be a major nuisance for all of our tenants to have that building taken down and new development put up. Um, but our, our big concern is they're just, I don't think that's enough parking spaces for what he's looking at putting in uh, 40, 47 units, uh, 47 units, sorry, 59 units, is it? 46. With 37 spaces. That's, that's not enough for even each unit to have a spot, let alone your visitor parking, your contractors to park and such. So definitely a concern of ours. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, did you wish to make representations? Uh, Noah, is there another individual here? Yeah, you're, you're welcome to end at the mic for comments. Your name, everybody. name and address. Frank Paulinuk, 110 Marwain. I babysat that property for 50 years with Red Cross. Is that awesome? I'm babysitting now. You know what I'm talking about? This company owes me two no property, or no trust and signs if they want to get me to. I chased off your tents, cities. You know, somebody wanted to make a tent there. I've been doing this for a year and a half now since Red Cross left. The grass has not been cut. I've been cutting at least by front of my residence. It's been a mess. I have to call the city. Never in my life. They came and, I guess, contractor cut it. And you had a B&E that I chased a bunch of kids with the hockey stick, whatever you want to use. I called your police. They're, they're busy. So I, sorry, I did that in my own hands. But right now, nobody's looking after it. I've been policing that property for my own, picking up garbage, everything. But that's not why I'm here. Uh, let's go back 25 years. Got flooded out by sewer twice in one week. The the sewer water, like not brown water. And the city came. It was not my fault. It's at Chapel and Allard, where the main is some problem there. Nothing's been done in 25 years. They said it's overloaded. So they clean our, you know, that pressure washer. They do the sewer. Twice a year, I think, now, because of that. They said there's, there's a lot of people there, a lot of uh, bathrooms and excess, whatever you put down the toilet. So now, okay, nothing's been done. I don't know what you want to do about that. My water now, I got my pressure. I had pressure problems two years ago off Allard. So we've, the city said it's, they don't know what's wrong, but they made me put a new water line in off Allard. Sorry, I'll make Marwing. So now the pressure is so so, but something happened to the water line and alerts. All the infrastructure, I don't think it's very good there for 40 more people or more houses. But definitely the sewer, Chapel and Allard has a something in there that they told me when I got flooded out, it cost me a little mother insurance but twice in one week. The sewer. 43 inches in my basement. But that's 25 years ago. But now they they do the steam, eh? But who says they're going to do it all the time? Three times, twice a year. Definitely that is, uh, I never see no work done on, it's a big job, I presume. But uh, right now, I mean, I had 
how many times I you know broken into, but that's it's okay. But now it's not too bad. The different people. What am I going to deal with now? The parking? Yes. How many times I got to block my street to get to get out to go to work? I'm just jammed right up. Are you talking about parking? There's no parking. Um, like I got to block my street, get out, go to work, or it's just jammed. I can't get out. Who do you call? I don't know what you do. Took license plate numbers. I don't know what you do with it. Push them away with the plow. No. <laughs> they park like. Yeah, but I babysat that. I picked up garbage and I did for fifty years. And the Red Cross was awesome tenant. Right now, I went through two, three tenants now before that. Um, Bertel, am I saying right? Rob, Rob Bertel. He was good. He, he just bought it off of Red Cross. Awesome. He was going to do a six. Well, I said, well, that's a good idea. Six, it's like whatever. But I never ever did get information on an apartment being built because I came to here to a meeting. They canceled uh, maybe three months ago. Nobody gave me a say there was going to be rezoning. I don't know where it's kept that path. So now I'm coming for parking. And, but the sewer I'm worried about, the water is not. Pressure's ridiculous for now. I got a six-inch main in front of my house. They wanted me to buy the street maybe 15 years ago. But there's a six-inch main going down from Willow to Allard. But whatever the case is, I hired a babysitter and a mess. Like, clean it up. Then it's going to be more of a mess. Back to the parking. I don't know what you, you got no parking now. I mean, every park's no parking signs on the other side. I don't care about that. That's not me, but they're blocking me in all the time. The grader just goes right by if there's cars in there. So what? I'll clean it up. That's about it. Thank you, man. Councilor Udo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was just wondering if uh, Mr. Tanasso could address uh, these concerns about the sewer being overused. Mr. Tanasso, has that been checked? I believe Mr. Girardi might have okay. some information on that. To you, Mr. Through Mr. Mayor to uh, Council, I guess um, I'll refer the question part of the question over to Carl. From an operations perspective, we do it twice yearly now. Uh, that goes through our whole city program, so this site would be cleaned out twice yearly. Uh, but it is a part of an annual program that we will continue to run. So I don't think there's been any issues uh, since we complete and do that work. But it is mandatory. We do have to do that type of work, but it's through the city. I'll refer also to Carl in case he has something to say. Mr. Mayor to Council Pluto. I don't have much more to add than that. There is a 250 millimeter diameter sewer. And just that as a high level review, um, there's not a huge area that's, that's being contributed to that. So generally that would that would be pre pretty pretty good sized sewer. Um, we did recommend that this be referred to uh, site plan control. So at the end of the day, the developer is going to have to give us a an engineer's report and and say how this this property is going to be serviced and that will include verifying the downstream capacity of the sewers and our infrastructure with respect to the water i can't really comment on that that would be uh, the puc to talk about their undersized uh, water distribution okay thank you and with respect to uh was there was there other questions there uh council Caputo? i know you asked to, to comment on the on the comments that were made by the resident yeah, just more of a um, a comment to uh, Mr. Moxness. I just wanted to um, say I can empathize with you where you're saying some things are out of your control, like break-ins. Um, but what I have a hard time with in this at this time is there are a lot of things that are in your control that we're getting a lot of uh, complaints about: bed bugs, uh, tenants without heat. Um, our resident here just uh, just cited grass cutting. Um, 
while I can appreciate some things, you know, in certain areas might be more difficult to control, uh, cutting your grass and giving your tenants heat uh, is not, are not uh, ones that, you know, are not in your control. So I, uh, I hope that if you're going to be uh, furthering developments in our community, you're going to be responsible for the things that uh, that are in your control like this. Um, I, I had a resident call me recently about bed bugs in one of your properties saying that uh, uh, they had contacted your management company and that you said nothing could, be, or not you personally, but nothing could be done or nothing would be done. Um, that's unacceptable. Uh, if we have to approve this rezoning on principle, um, then that's fine. But um, I really think that you need to take a look at, you know, what's happening at the, in these properties in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the end of my comments. Thank you. Can I make a comment back to that? Or, or not? I, I don't think unless it's specific to the rezoning, then I, I don't think that uh, there's anything we need to hear. Is it specific to the rezoning? No, just as you guys mentioned, um, just my general character and intent it would relate to that but um it's not related to this specific application so mr moxness i i mean you have been sitting through this council meeting i'm sure not terribly comfortable for you not terribly comfortable for us either to be honest um <clears throat> uh, the the rezoning you present to us makes a lot of sense if we're going to densify areas that are already dense Yes, there's some concerns. There's some concerns with parking. There's some concerns with downstream capacity, all things that I think need to be managed. Uh, the uh, the uh, property manager from Pine Aller described the ongoing work that she has to undertake to uh, manage the parking situation at her property. I suspect that you would have to undertake similar type uh, extensive efforts to manage it with this significant reduction that you're asking for at your property. Um, but on in you know based on the planning recommendation the planning principles that are set out in the report makes a lot of sense but it is obvious that council is very displeased with your property maintenance of properties that you have in town including as the resident uh, who lives next to your uh, property that's the subject of this report mentions at this very site grass cutting uh, 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 people get, being able to get in and out of the building. Some of those things are out of your control, as Councillor Caputo said, some of them are not. And uh, we haven't had much of a chance to speak directly to you. And so you're hearing it from us tonight. And I hope you're hearing it loud and clear because it is frustrating and unacceptable. And the type of property management that you, the type of property maintenance that you allow to take hold at your mini holdings in the community is frankly deplorable. And so uh, I'm going to support this rezoning uh, because on planning principles, it makes good sense. But I hope the message has gotten through to you that we are very unhappy with how you manage your properties in town. Okay. Um, that this I'll call for... Unless it's on the rezoning, unless it's on the rezoning application specifically. Yeah, it, this particular one, I'll make it just about that. Um, in this particular property, I think the development would help that gentleman who was speaking. Um, there wouldn't be, if, especially if it's knocked down, there wouldn't be anybody uh, breaking into the property. There wouldn't be anybody hanging around that property. And then it's also been uh, in this state for many years since the Red Cross has gone out of business or moved around. Um, so I think this would be an improvement in general. And, you know, while some of the comments that you make may be valid, um, our intent is to um, uh, improve these properties. And we are trying to do that. Let's hope so. Council, all in favor of this rezoning? Oh, she's got to read the motion. I'm getting ahead of myself again. I have a motion by Councillors Zagordo and Hollingsworth resolved that the report of the junior planner dated March 18th, 2024 concerning rezoning application A-9-23-Z dash 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 be received and that council approve the application as follows. Rezone the subject property from medium density residential R4.373 zone with special exception 373 to medium density residential R4.S373 zone 
with amended special exception 373 to repeal existing provisions and replace with the following new provisions. One, permit parking in the required front yard. Two, permit parking in the required exterior side yard. Three, reduce the westerly interior side yard setback from 7.5 meters to seven meters. Four, reduce the southerly rear yard setback from 10 meters to 7.5 meters. Reduce the number of required parking spaces from 59 to 37 spaces, 1.25 to 0.79 ratio for the proposed 47 unit apartment building. And six, waive the requirement that a loading zone be 100% visually screened and that the legal department be requested to prepare the necessary bylaws to affect the same. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries. That will move us to agenda item 8.7.3, gentle density proposed amendments to the official plan and zoning bylaw regarding residential development regulations. Mr. Tanazo, it's a 30 page report. So I'll ask you to just give a very brief uh, summary of it. Thank you, Mayor Shoemaker. This is a city led application that applies throughout the community uh, and aims to provide greater zoning flexibility uh, to construct more types of dwellings and higher residential densities in more zones uh, with the overall goal of increasing housing supply. Uh, so the proposed amendments, uh, they'll result in a, in a form-based zoning approach, which doesn't necessarily concern itself with the type of uh, the type or number of residential units. Rather, the focus is on residential developments being able to achieve um, specific performance standards, such as minimum setbacks, minimum parking requirements, minimum landscaping requirements, maximum walk coverage, and, and most importantly, really for this one, maximum height, which would be all zone specific performance standards. And, and these all work together to establish a building envelope uh, within which various configurations of dwelling units can be constructed. Uh, again, so long as they can achieve the zone specific building envelope, they'll be permitted as a matter of right, regardless of the type of dwelling unit or the number of dwelling units. Again, single semi townhouse, it really takes that a, what we would call an inclusionary way of zoning out of out of the equation and, and again makes it more form based based upon what can you fit in that building envelope, the building envelope being an envelope that's consistent with the surrounding area. And again, building height being the real important one here. Uh, again, this application consists of over 100 inv individual zoning amendments. Uh, which are recommended for approval, and I'm available should council have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, <laughs> Councillor, <laughs> what did you, uh, Mr. Tenazzo, Councillor Hollingsworth? Thank you, uh, through you, Mayor, to Mr. Tenazzo. Um, very good report, a lot of useful, helpful information. Can you just comment on does this help us as a community to potentially build tiny homes? Through you, Mayor Shoemaker, absolutely, right? So it's it's form-based zoning. So if it's a smaller footprint, you should be able to fit more, more dwelling units on property. So it doesn't concern itself with the size. It just concerns itself with the building envelope. So I would say that, yes, it does. I'm glad um, I thought so. I just wanted that clarification because I know there's a lot of developers in our community that are eager to start tiny homes. That would definitely help um, our housing needs, uh, especially with those that have aging parents that want to be close to them. So um, so are you saying that hypothetically, if you have a developer maybe starting next week that wants to do tiny homes, they have the green light or will there be other steps? Uh, through you, Mayor Shoemaker, next week might be a little bit soon. I think council has to pass this. We have to get through the appeal period. I, I would suggest that based on the current zoning bylaw, the current zoning bylaw doesn't have a minimum floor space requirement. So somebody could do a tiny home today. What these amendments will do will make it easier to potentially put multiple tiny homes on one lot as opposed to just one. Okay, great. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hollingsworth. Councillor Bernie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you to Mr. Tanazo for the report. I do agree with the report. The only, the only concern I have is regarding uh, established neighborhoods when you have a piece of empty pro when you have an empty piece of property and single dwelling homes on each side and then a massive fourplex is built 
I, I just don't know how that would fit in the neighborhood. And uh, that's my main concern. Um, also, other concerns regarding the property values of, say, those two houses, one on each side. Um, and we can go back to, as our last applicant, the capacity of the water, storm water and the, and the uh, sewer. Uh, we all know our infrastructure is weak by adding four plexes, which uh, um, becomes R3. Um, that's my concern, but I do agree with the report. We do need more homes. Uh, I, I just think we have to be cautious where we're going to allow these, uh, say, for instance, a fourplex. And especially on your presentation, which was uh, 30 pages long, there were some pictures in there. And pictures don't do it justice, I guess, in the sense that it, it does, doesn't look good when you see a fourplex uh, in between two single dwelling homes. So that's my point. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bruni. Other councillors with questions or comments? Councillor Dufour? Yeah, uh, just a question to start. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to um, Mr. Tanazo, was there ever, uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the special exemptions for downtown in the heightened performance standards and talk us through what some of the considerations were for giving those uh, flexible standards to downtown and why the standards that were picked were picked? Uh, through you, Mayor Shoemaker, to Councillor DeFore. So, the downtown part of the downtown is characterized by very high density ma maximum lot coverages at times that are 60 to 90 percent and very small lots so the exemptions that, that we've built into the downtown area are, are essentially to allow that current character uh to to continue on and to allow those areas to be redeveloped without having to come back to council for variances or, or rezonings because again the way that these older parts of the community the way that they've developed is rather larger buildings on very small lots. Um, was there ever any consideration to giving um, other downtown specific uh, exemptions for the actual uh, distances for things like exterior side yards, rear yards, um, giving downtown less of, a, less of a distance to worry about there than other areas of the town? Or did planning want to have more of a uniform approach with um, those yard distances and height? Yeah, th through you, Mr. Mayor, what, and, and I think to one of Councillor Bruni's comments, what was very important for us was to have, you know, we've, it's form-based zoning now. So we've done away with the type, restricting the type and number of dwelling units, but we've based that building envelope largely on what exists in the zones today. So that you may have a fourplex, but it's going to fit in the same building envelope that one could build a two-story big single detached home. So it was very important to us to try to keep that character the same. So that you may have a higher density and you may have more units, but you're still going to be within that envelope. So we really base those envelopes on the existing, the zones as they exist. And as you know, there's a couple of different zones that exist in our downtown. Uh, now we have overarching um exclusions if you will if you're in the defined downtown but the 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 performance standards are largely based on whether it's the c2 zone which is you know 100 percent watt coverage maximum height and then you have that commercial transitional zone which exists in the downtown but has a, a much lower density so the goal was to try to keep those building envelopes consistent with what they are today thanks mr Nazo. um did you want us to do comments now as well um so just as my comment, uh, I just want to commend planning for what I think is uh, a really extensive um, and a very um, broad-based rethink over how we tackle our zoning bylaw. And I think that they've ended up in a place that makes a lot of sense, that hopefully the development community is going to find a lot simpler and clearer. Um, I, I definitely support uh, things like the future upzoning uh, of our two areas. I think that my only fear and concern, um, also going back to our, our last comments, is that the city has very little regulatory ability to regulate the behavior and the character of landlords in our community. And so I think that when you get to the zoning bylaw, it, it's kind of acted as this firewall, so to speak, um, to 
quote unquote, protect certain areas in certain neighborhoods from rental housing, um, which has terrible long-term consequences for all of our communities. But in the absence of a better regulatory environment for landlord behavior, um, it, it's been the best that we've had for a generation. And so uh, I definitely understand the fears and concerns of those who see that firewall being taken away. And I think that our city needs to um, take a real hard look um, and, and maybe have some harder conversations with our provincial partners on, you know, what we're going to do to address any potential gaps that might be created as we move away from that. So um, that's something that hopefully we can have some more robust conversations about, um, perhaps at the task force level, but uh, that that's where my mind is going as, as we look to approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dufour. Councillor Bezuelan. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Mr. Chinazzo. Um, Peter, I'm going on page seven, um, and I just want to get better clarification on the um, through the Bill 23, the accessory use second units. And I'm kind of, my concern is, is that if it is existing townhome or semi-detached home, that there can be additional residential development. And what we are seeing in some of the more um, densely populated areas, such as in the pea patch where we have a townhome or semi that's used to house like, seven, eight, six students, how can we um, ensure that we still have safe and appropriate housing? And while I appreciate the, you know, increasing the density, could you please walk us through how that looks? You know, I, I can read it, but I think hearing it from you would, would be better. Uh, through, me, through you, Mayor Shoemaker to Councillor Vezuel. And so we're, we're just really repealing the term secondary unit because we're still required to permit second and third units as a matter of right. And, and much of the complexity of the amendments are to stay on side of Bill 23, which requires us to permit second and third units in association with any single semi or townhouse dwelling, although we're getting rid of the definitions of single semi and townhouse. So a lot of the complexity that's built into this is so that we can stay on side of that. Again, it's based on the building envelope, whether you're a single, a semi, or a townhouse, you can still put that second or third unit, whether it's in the building, behind the building, so long as you meet the performance standards. So we're, we're, we're just really repealing that term because really there is no need for it anymore, certainly in our urban area. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that specifically answers your question. I think it's more in terms of safe dwellings and adherence to the building code, like are we going to be seeing more and more site plan needed, more and more inspectors happening? Like, how are we going to um, meet up with the demand to make sure that if someone is doing a secondary unit that is compliant and that, like I, we had spoken before when we were dealing with this issue with um, Airbnbs, like, could we have, you know, an Airbnb cheat, cheat sheet of this is what you need if you're going to have a secondary unit? Like, I think, I think that's really important because some people may... Um, purchase a home, whether they're putting it in a nanny flat for an older parent or whether they're thinking it would be great to have a couple of students or whatever that might be, you know, just to ensure that people are living in, in safe accommodations, I think right now is sort of a, a concern with all of us around that table. Uh, through you, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, so that would be a building code matter, build, a combination of building code, fire code, property standards. It's not necessarily the zoning bylaw that really gets into the seat. Of the of of the unit in and of itself, that would be up to site control. And well, site plan control could speak to sort of the ex, again the exterior portions of the development. You, you don't go inside the walls of the development. It just speaks to the exterior portions. And one one of the the biggest impacts that Bill Twenty Three had for us is that any residential development that's less than ten units, we cannot use site plan control on anymore. So it, it these these. What might be medium-sized infill developments for us, maybe in other parts of the province, they'd be small. Um, we can no longer use site control for any development that's less than 10 residential units. Thank you, Peter. Council, any other questions? Mr. Tenazzo, I just want to say that this is um, probably the 
if I had to guess, the biggest change to city zoning since the introduction of the zoning bylaw in what, 1971, 72, somewhere around there? Uh, three, Mr. or to you, Mr. Mayor, 1967, and, and yes, I would agree with you. So it's it's exciting. It's obviously going to have its challenges, but it's uh, uh, way more ambitious, I think, than where the uh, province or federal government wanted us to go. The feds, uh, the province mandated that we go to three units on any given property as of right. The federal government wanted us to go to four units as of right. And what you have suggested is whatever fits within kind of the character of the neighborhood, I think is the best way to describe it within a building that would match the character of the, the zoning, generally speaking, of that neighborhood. You can have as many units as you want, provided it fits within the building that fits within the character. So it is really ambitious. And uh, I hope we see lots of densification of properties in the community, because I think we have lots of space for densification, frankly. And uh, a dense use of property is a more efficient use of property, a more efficient uh, delivery of services from the municipal perspective. And uh, if it works, and I hope it does, then uh, I uh, I look forward to seeing the results of these changes uh, over the next several generations. So thank you uh, for the report. And it's also very well written. I would like to commend uh, the writer of the report uh, on a very well written, understandable report that it was easy to follow, even though it was 30 plus pages. You read the motion? Okay. I have a motion by Councillors Caputo and Hollingsworth resolved that the report of the planner dated March 18, 2024 concerning gentle density be received and that council approve this application in the following manner. Amend the official plan as outlined in OPA 249. Amend zoning bylaw 2005-150 as outlined in Schedule A proposed zoning amendments and that the legal department be requested to prepare the necessary bylaws to affect the same. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Brings us to the consent agenda, I believe. That's correct. And I have received a request to pull 7.5 uh, use of consultants for city operations and 7.16 downtown business di district revitalization from the consent agenda. Okay. So anything, anybody with questions on any of those items other than 7.5 and 7.16? Council? Councillor Hollingsworth, and then Caputo, and then Dufour. Thank you. Um, we'll start with item 7.7, 7, 2023 investment report. Through you, Mayor, to, I guess, Shelley Shell. Um, basically, you mentioned about the short term. Um, can you define um, short term in this sense of the investment? I'm assuming it's less than one year. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, uh, it ranges from 12 to 18 months. Usually the average is about a year. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, you also in your report mentioned RBC net investment return at about 3.2%, I believe. Um, can you just um, refresh my memory what type of investment vehicle this is? So the funds through RBC Dominion Securities are for the care and maintenance fund. Those are funds that we are not allowed to utilize the principal. We can only use the interest. So we have what's called a laddered approach. We range from one to five years for our investment, hence why the rate of return will be a little bit lower because there are some investments that were at lower rates of return um, through that ladder. Um, does that answer what you were looking for? Yeah, just again, with the interest rates still very positive and high, I just want to make sure that we are getting the best return. Okay, that's all for the, that particular item. Anyone else on 7.7? .7? Councillor Hollingsworth, other items on consent? Yes, a few more. Uh, item 7.9, removal and disposal hazards. And I believe the author of this report is our purchasing manager, Karen Marlowe. I don't, yeah. Yep, she's okay. Um, I have a few questions <laughs> towards Karen or for Karen. Through you, Mayor, um, to Ms. Merlot. It's my understanding that from your report, you're suggesting that we support GFL. Is that correct? Okay. 
And in your report, and as we know all around this table, we have used GFL for many other services, correct? As one example, I believe is our collection. Yes, yes, we have them for collection. This is a um, GFL environmental, slightly different corporation. A slightly different corporation, so they're not under the same parent company? I'm not sure if Ms. Marlowe knows the corporate structure of GFL and who, which parent company is parent to which subsidiary, but probably if they're using the term GFL, they're all related. Okay. My point, my point I'm making is that um, since we use other services of GFL, did you consider in the negotiating to bundle these services to get the best price? And if not at this time, can we in the future bundle it and go back to the company to say, that we're using many of your services. I think Ms. Hamilton Beach will probably field that question. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Hollingsworth. This service here has been tendered for a number of years, and it's specifically uh, the collection of the hazardous material, which the other, um, certainly bundling that would be involving a different level of expertise and then a different uh, collector, hauler, licensing, et cetera. So uh, most of this material is sent out of the community for proper care and handling. I can appreciate that. Again, I was just getting, if it's the same, hypothetically, if it's the same company, GFL, and we're using them again for another um, type of service, maybe in the future, we could ask for a further discount um, in the future negotiating if we're using their services. I'm just wondering, as we move forward in working with other companies that may be providing services like another company, XYZ, and they know they're providing this service and that service, that we can ask for a further discount. It's it's a practice in societies or practice in bus, in the business world. Um, that's my point. Sir? Please. Um, sir, um, again, this is a slight different like, division of GFL. It's a totally different uh, silo of of the business different contact, et cetera. They, they don't run together in this particular instance, but certainly it could be brought forward to them in the future to see if they can coordinate their two businesses for one. Okay, thank you. That's all. Anyone else on 7.9? Okay, seeing none, Councilor Hollingsworth, other matters on consent? Item 7.13, property tax appeals. Okay. To you, Mayor, to... I believe um, Lisa will be Shelly Show. Okay. Um, Michelle, are we um, over the last five years, actually, ironically, today's the anniversary for four years ago when COVID was um, officially announced where we went in lockdown. Isn't that amazing? Four years have passed that quickly. Um, are we trending up or trending down when it comes to the tax uh, appeals over the last, let's say, two years and the last five years? Mr. Council of um, I wouldn't have that data in front of me, uh, but I can say that it doesn't, uh, the trend of this, it really depends on what's going on. There, there's, these are all different types of appeals for taxes. You'll see it's, it's a change in use, uh, fire issues, it's raised a building. So it, it just depends on the circumstances. So there's not really a direct correlation to trends to, to building and that type of thing or collection. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. That's all. Anyone else on 713? Okay, seeing none. Councillor Hollingsworth, other items on consent? One last point. Um, yeah, I'm going back to 7.3, not going back, but visiting 7.3, 2023 housing targets. Um, I apologize. I can't remember who is the author of this report, but through you, Mayor, to the author. This is wonderful that um, we have met our targets and it looks like we might be on track for the future. Um, so my first question um, is, so it sounds like we have exceeded the 2023 um, target. And if I read it correctly, um, we have exceeded it basically by, let's see, 213 or 194% as my understanding. Is that correct? That's right. That's excellent. And it's my understanding, just for clarification, that um, 
we'll what basically we'll have another target, but what is our overall target, assigned target um, for 2031? I think we are still working towards an overall target. Is that correct? Yes, 1,500 is our overall target between now and 2031. Okay. And uh, the positive side, based on all our discussion today, tonight, and the previous, I think we're going to be fine. Um, we have the strong mayor's point right now, and I know in all respect that um, you are very gracious to basically make sure that you're not using those, but... Um, at any time as we exceed our targets, is there a chance for us to pull back that strong mayor point or do we have to keep it until 2031 or until we exceed our 1500 target? What's in our power? Well, I think uh, I'll, I'll ask Ms. Fields field the question uh, for the most part, but uh, the strong mayor powers that were able to be delegated back either to council or to administration have been delegated back. Um, so there is only some limited instances uh, where the power still exists. They haven't and don't intend to use it. Um, and we just uh, comply with, uh, with the legislation to uh, carry out budget practices, for example, and zone rezonings in the way we always have with some additional paperwork to be in technical compliance with the, uh, with the strong mayor legislation. Ms. Fields, anything to add to that? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor to Councillor Hollingsworth, I, I'd have to look at it again, but I don't recall an opting out uh, provision. We either had to opt out from the beginning or once we opted in, we were in. So I believe that's what it is. Okay, thank you. And one last question with regards to this. So if I read the report correctly, um, we must submit an investment plan. Um, where do we stand on this submission? Who is creating this plan at the uh, this moment? And what is the focus? And when do we have to submit it by the investment plan? Mr. Tanazo will respond to that. Uh, through you, Mayor Shoemaker, I, I again, it, it's very early and they haven't come out yet to say what the investment plan has to entail. And I so so we're waiting to hear on that requires. My guess is that the investment plan would be like, what are we going to do with the money, right? So would it be the, the group of incentives? And again, we don't know quite yet from the province exactly how we can expend these funds as well. So we're just waiting to get some of that clarification. And then I would imagine it would be planning with the affordable housing task force that would sort of lead that investment plan and sort of communicate that back to council. Okay. So hypothetically, potentially we could be, looking at um, single moms uh, residents or residents for those that are more vulnerable? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, absolutely. I think when you look at sort of the, the draft of the community improvement plan and the way that our incentives will roll out, they'll certainly, you know, as we currently have it formatted, there's going to be a much higher incentive if you're providing affordable units, which tend to be those units that are for those that need them the most. Okay, one last question. So you mentioned that the investment plan will be probably written by your department, your team, and the which other group did you mention? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the, the Affordable Housing Task Force. Okay, and is there a council member on that task force? I believe there is, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, so Councilor, Councilors DeFore and Caputo uh, sit on that task force, and then Mayor Shoemaker is an ex officio that sits on the task force as well. Perfect. I just think it's important that the community understands that, um, that we are all very much concerned about this plan and we have the right people at the table. Thank you. Anyone else on 7-3? Councillor Zagordo? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Mr. Tanazzo. Um, I see the correspondence is dated February 14th. Is there an amount that's been allocated for us once we go through and complete the paperwork that's required of us? Through you, Mayor Shoemaker, right now, because we because we exceeded it by so much, we're of the opinion that it, that it will likely get capped. Uh, we're thinking that we might be eligible from anywhere from four hundred to six hundred thousand dollars for for this particular year. That's wonderful. Now, is the amount based, uh, formula based, or is it once we reach our target, there's a maximum amount, that's it, or if you exceed that funding bill 
proportional to that. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So yeah, it's it starts at 80%. I, I can't remember where it ends, but we kind of went off the charts to, to be honest uh, with our performance. Um, so it, I believe 120% was, was the last which we exceeded. So we think we're going to be capped um, sort of beyond that, but it is based again on the percentage. So there, there's the, the amount that you get if you're hundred percent, which was 400,000 and then it either goes up or down depending on how your performance is. Well, that's great news. So thank you for that. Just to reiterate on, on that point, I think it's an important one. Had we hit our target at a hundred percent, we would have been eligible for 400,000. We're at almost 200% of our target. So uh, whatever, you know, the most anyone can get under this fund is, we're probably going to be eligible for as a percentage of, of that number that we were uh, that we were allocated. So it's great news. Uh, we, uh, you know, uh, are, are doing very well with respect to our target. And uh, hopefully that continues for many years to come. We continue to be eligible for uh, the Building Faster Fund for as long as uh, it is in place. Any other councillors on 7.3? Okay, Councillor Hollingsworth, other matters on consent? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Now I have Councillor Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, I would just like to comment on uh, 7.2, uh, the intimate partner violence letter from uh, uh, Minister Arif Farani. Um, I'd like to thank the minister for the detailed response and for his efforts to address uh, any gaps in the criminal code, as well as protect, protect against IPV. I'd also like to thank you for uh, sending the initial letter on behalf of council. Um, <clears throat> while there are many ways to strengthen the criminal justice system's uh, response to IPV mentioned, uh, the mention of Bill C-332 is of particular interest um, I've been in close contact with Angie's Angels members, uh, Renee Buxel and Lindsay Stewart, uh, best friends of Angie Sweeney. Um, though I realize members of council uh, have not forgotten the horrific events that took place um, and took the lives of Angie Sweeney and three beautiful and innocent uh, children in our community, I would be remiss not to mention it again, as I made promise uh, to never stop saying their names. Uh, Bill C-332 is an act to amend the criminal code concerning um, controlling or co coercive conduct brought forward um, by Laurel Collins as a private member's bill. Uh, it seeks to amend the criminal code uh, to create an offense of engaging in controlling or, co or coercive conduct uh, that has a significant impact on the person towards whom that conduct is related, including uh, fear of violence, a decline in their physical and mental health, or substantial adverse effects on their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, Angie's closest friends have told me that they believe that having this type of legislation could have saved her life. Um, myself, along with my colleague, uh, Councillor Vezo Allen, um, have been in contact with them and will continue to push for this legislation to move forward um, and benefit those in these unimaginable um, situations. And we will be looking for council support on that in the very near future. Um, again, I just wanna thank the Honorable uh, Minister Virani and uh, Mayor Shoemaker for sending that letter. Uh, and I just wanted to shed some light on that. Thank you, Councillor Caputo. Councillor Vezo Allen. Thank you. And I just want to add that in 1993, which is over 30 years ago, the UN Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women stated physical aggression, sexual coercion, psychological abuse, controlling behaviors, all part of IPV. So we're over 30 years, but we're seeing some progress. And I'm honored to be um, with Councillor Caputo, having regular contact with Lindsay and Renee. It's... Um, bittersweet that two friends have to come together to create change, but they're two very determined young women and uh, we're definitely here to help them in whatever way we can. But this has been part of the dialogue for over 30 years globally. So I certainly appreciate the work um, by you, Mayor, and having the letter written and Minister Verani's response. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Vezuelan. Any other councillors on 7-2? I would uh, also just like to Thank the minister. The very detailed response with with specific things that are 
happening to attempt to prevent future incidences of IPV more than just kind of over generalizations about the uh, obvious uh, uh, negative aspects of it, but very uh, find uh, proposed actions that they hope will help prevent future tragedies. So, uh, thank the minister for that. Councillor Caputo, other items on consent? Uh, yes, um, 7.23, the site-specific planning. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Peter Tanasso. Um, Peter, I'm just wondering, um, I know we had sort of touched on uh, going into um, using online methods of communication to um, inform folks of site-specific planning uh, instances, but um, would you say that we could potentially save those dollars and go ahead uh, with the uh, use of the signs on the sites? And do you think that would be sufficient at this point? Uh, through you, Mayor Shoemaker, to Councillor Caputo. Um, as Council may recall, we, we brought a report in October um, recommending that we wanted to switch our, our statutory notice for Site-Specific Planning Act applications uh, to go to a sign um, as opposed to in print newspaper and, and a sign on the property along with a mail out we thought would be the best way and the most appropriate way to, to reach the neighbourhood uh, and those that are mostly impacted by these site-specific rezonings. Um, and now at that time, we, we weren't contemplating online media in addition to that. Um, however, I think Council passed a resolution asking us to, to come back and, and, and look at online media. I, I think ultimately we would reach even more people um, with the online media, but we don't have the budget that, that we know that it would take. Um, so the way that we've structured the recommendation, we're of the opinion that the sign on the property and the mail out will be sufficient um, and will, be, will appropriately engage the, the community in which the, zone, the site specific rezoning is happening. Um, being able to put something online would, would certainly go above and beyond that, but there's a cost associated with that. So for that reason, we have sort of structured the recommendation in two parts um, because we would like to move forward with the site specific signs. Um, and then at a future, you know, at, at, a, at the, the next budget, we would then make that request um, and council can make that decision. And if they so choose. So at this point, uh, Mr. Tanasso, we will be approving the use of the sign and then um, the extra funds would have to be approved through budget is what you're saying. Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. We we can do, we can switch from the print media to a, a sign as sort of a cost neutral um, endeavor. Uh, and, and that's what we're really being asked to be approved tonight. And, and it wouldn't cost any additional money. Okay, thank you. Um, as one of the people who asked about online media, um, I do appreciate you coming back with this response. Um, I think perhaps uh, one, one day we can get there, but uh, just right now for myself personally, uh, it's a little bit steep and I think maybe we could take that money and use it elsewhere, but I do appreciate um, your efforts in, in looking into this. Anyone else on 7.23? Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, to Mr. Tanazo. When you talk about the sign, how long will the sign be posted for? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, at a minimum, it has to be posted for 20 days in advance of the council meeting. That's the statutory requirements. It's a 20 day notice. Okay, 20 days. That's good to hear. My concern is that we talked about this before is that we have many people that work out of town. For example, those that work in the mines um, that may not get back to their neighborhood in time to see the sign or to basically receive the notice in their mailbox. Or there's other people that live or not live, but just work again out of town or a holiday and they're snowbirds and they're gone for three months and so forth. So with regards to Councillor Caputo, I really do feel that um, social media or some type of online uh, should be used um, to help those that cannot be back in their neighborhood in 20 days or 
10 days or 30 days or whatever, because we do have a population that work out in different areas of Canada and will not see this in time to make a comment. Thank you. Councillor Hollingsworth. Other councillors on 723? Councillor Zagordo. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Mr. Tanazzo. Um, just in terms of the two things in point one, where we are notifying landowners within 120 meters and now signage, is that falling within the act or will fall within the act? But through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Zagoro, yeah. So that is that will meet our statutory requirement. Right now, we actually go about the, the you have the choice of either doing a, a print media or a newspaper ad or the sign and the mail out. We actually do the newspaper ad and the mail out. We're, 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 we're looking to go to the, the sign and the mail out going forward. So that would meet our statutory. So that would meet it. So we're looking at <clears throat> uh, online media would then be above and beyond what's required of us. Is that true? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Zagordo, that, that's correct. And, and right now, the Planning Act actually doesn't recognize um, online media. Um, it, it's only print media that you can do as your statutory ad right now. Thank you. Anyone else on 723? Seeing none. Councilor Caputo, other items on consent? No, that's everything. Thank you. Councilor Dufour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just on 7.17, uh, I don't know if Virginia's here. Yes. Um, just through you, Mr. Mayor, um, Virginia, thanks very much for bringing this to us. Um, it's uh, pretty obvious from reading the report that uh, there's definitely a lot more demand for this funding out there than um, we currently provide. Um, I see that we have a first and second intake. Is there a follow-up with folks who were not successful on the first intake to help them uh, maybe further clarify their application before the second intake? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Dufour. Yes, uh, we've absolutely had meetings with the different candidates, um, is working with them in their applications um, and sharing the feedback that was received. Uh, so I believe she's already had six meetings with um, candidates that are applying or reapplying for the next take. Okay, that's great. And I just like to highlight for uh, council and the community that, um, you know, attached to our agenda were uh, what looked like a lot of really uh, exciting proposals for, you know, what is valuable um, funding, especially for um, artists, projects, um, things that are getting started. A, a lot of our arts and culture in Sault Ste. Marie is going to be driven by a lot of those um, newer artists, smaller promotions, things like that. Um, and there, Sault Ste. Marie has always really punched above its weight in arts and culture, I believe. And so it's really neat to see um, uh, a lot of subscription to this and something we definitely want to keep in mind for future budget meetings is that uh, the demand is so significantly outstripping what we have available. So thanks, Virginia. So, thank you, Councillor Dufour. Anyone else on seven seventeen, Councillor Hull, uh, Councillor Vesuelen? Sorry, I just had a comment, um, very similar to what Councillor Dufour was saying. There were twenty four applications, and we only funded um, 11. 11. And uh, what was really great to see, though, was the um, diversity, not just in um, it was groups, individuals, but also genre. There was a lot of there was some multimedia, there was performance. Um, so we do have a lot of talent, as I know, because I need to go buy tickets for about four things that are coming up. Um, so I think it is important for us to understand, you know, we always look at the um, social determinants of health and quality of life pillars and, and culture is a really huge one that I think you can't define or put um, a dollar number on, but it is really so important. So thanks Virginia and, and your team for what you do. And we really appreciate it. And it's exciting to see what we have funded and uh, looking forward to seeing the second round. Any other councillors on 717? Councillor Dufour, other items on consent? That's it. That's all. Councillor Vezuelen? I just have um, 7.15, just for some clarification. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to um, I think Mr. Anderson. In terms of the tourism event coordinator, it's $11,150 for 2024. 
And then from my understanding with the report, that person's position, is it a five-year contract? And then you would be looking. Mr. Mayor, to, sorry, not used to sitting down here. Uh, <laughs> through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council of Vesno Island. Um, I'll have to defer to finance to get the exact amount uh, year over year. Uh, the amount that's budgeted right now is based off of uh, budgeting for class three, um, which are sorry, step three, uh, which we won't be at until uh, I believe 2026. So um, I don't know if Shelly knows offhand what the remaining would be for four, four and five. <laughs> No, I don't have the exact numbers handy, but even just extrapolating for the current year um, to 12 months, you're looking at, you know, around $15,000 a year and annually that'll increase with the um, annual contractual increases as well. Okay. And this is going to be permanent in the budget? Will be permanent in the budget for the five years uh, okay. and uh, that it through tourism and my understanding uh, it'll be fully city funded once that uh if it, the job continues, it'll be uh, part of the city budget through the tourism MAT funds in the future. And further to that, um, Mr. Anderson, what is the expectation in terms of deliverables? I know it was an event a quarter. Um, what is the likelihood of that and what is the plan moving forward? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Vesno Allen. Um, at this point, uh, what we're looking at is we've identified a couple of key uh, pre-existing events uh, that are run by volunteers uh, through the community. So initially for this year, we're looking to support uh, those volunteers and help grow their events. Uh, as we build out beyond that, we're, we're actually going to be looking at some uh, greenfield events uh, and starting some new ones. So we're, uh, you know, at this point, um, just we'll be reaching out to the event organizers and establishing targets and hopefully sitting down with them and actually building out a, an event growth plan. Uh, with the hope of hitting, you know, the, the target of 500 to 1,000 people per quarter. Okay, thank you so much. Other councillors on 715? Mr. Bezuelan, any other items on consent? That is it, Mayor. Other councillors with items on consent? Mr. Fair. Uh, 7.6. An awesome business case. I trust that uh, all of council is heartily going to endorse this, but if you could give us a uh, idea of what the next steps are on this and uh, what we expect to come back to council and when, that would be helpful. Yes, to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we've had positive conversations with the uh, Northern Ontario School of Medicine University on uh, establishing or looking into the feasibility of establishing a uh, campus here in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, with council approval tonight, we will engage with NASM to develop a uh, request for proposals uh, that would go out to uh, seek a consultant to help us do that feasibility study. As well, we will be reaching out to the uh, partners mentioned in the report to get their input into this process and ensure that we engage all the uh, proper healthcare stakeholders in developing uh, this feasibility study. I think it's uh, exciting for the community. Um, and certainly um, there was a, a lot of enthusiasm in our conversation with Nassim U at the potential uh, for this site to really bring together some very innovative ways to train uh, not just physicians, but healthcare practitioners uh, that will be able to, uh, you know, uh, hopefully reside in the community in the future. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Barry. I think you summarized it well. Uh, I would just add to that, um, that um, the evidence of uh, the efforts in Sudbury and Thunder Bay to attract and retain physicians do uh, better than they do where there isn't uh, familiarity with the community like Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay and Timmins, uh, because people go there, they get to know the city, they get to love the city. Uh, we know that people who come to Sault Ste. Marie tend to love it and want to stay. Uh, so getting them here is the first uh, task. And I think if we are able to, by creating this uh, learning campus or, or developing this learning campus in our community, we will significantly improve um, the availability of healthcare practitioners um, in our community. It will also 
uh, improve or has the potential to improve uh, the um, training of international medical graduates. I, Dr. Aaron Smith is uh, is in the gallery. Uh, him and I had a long conversation uh, this afternoon about how having more medical uh, educators and practitioners here would help train international medical graduates, which would further enhance the availability of medical practitioners in our community. So uh, that is frankly, not one of the aspects that we spoke, uh, one of the potential benefits that we spoke with Nassim U about when uh, CAO Vare and I have met with them on a number of occasions, but one of the additional benefits that could come from such a campus. So uh, I am eager to see this proposal developed. And I think when it is, it will make the case or help us make the case that we need to be, and we ought to be the next growth phase for Nassim U. And I appreciate um the support we've received from Nossum U itself, from Northern Chiropractic and Physiotherapy, and just a short while ago from the Township of St. Joseph and Mayor Jody Wildman. Um, and I know there are others in the community who have lent their support uh, in various ways. Uh, so we uh, will, we, and by we, I mean the city kind of generally, tar spearheaded by uh, Mr. Vare, um, will uh, make sure that uh, council is kept updated on uh, on the progress and hopefully we uh, land somewhere positive soon. Any other council questions or comments on 7.6? Okay, same. Um, I just wanted to note that there is uh, an electric ice resurfacer uh, being purchased on our electric Zamboni, as it's probably more familiarly known. Uh, on the agenda 7.10, this will be the third electric Zamboni that the city is purchasing. One is already in service at the McMeekin. One has been purchased, in, or it's not the McMeekin, sorry, the Northern Community Center. Uh, one has um, been purchased and awaiting delivery also for the Northern Community Center. And if approved tonight, the John Rhodes will be getting its first electric uh, Zamboni. So that is great news, not just for the environment, but for the renewal of our Zamboni fleet, which as we know, we have had significant issue with in the past. So any other questions or comments on 710? Okay, seeing none, we can have a vote on the consent agenda. have a motion by Councillor Zagordo and Hollingsworth resolve that all the items listed under date March 18, 2024, agenda item seven, consent agenda, save and accept agenda items 7.5 and 7.16 be approved as recommended. All in favor. That carries. That will bring us to agenda item 7.5, use of consultants for city operations. Councilor Kinnick, you asked to have this pulled, so I will go to you first. I just have comments. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Um, so I just want to make uh, some comments about this report. Uh, CEO Vera, I agree with your first conclusion of the report, avoiding employing specialized staff that are not required as full-time employees, and agree that there are finance engineering and HR projects requirements, which consultants must be used for critical operations of the city. But aren't all of you sitting around us here today, specialized staff, which you stated in your report are not required as full-time employees. Maybe we can ha just hire consultants to do all city work. Overall, I'm disappointed and upset with this report. The people told council to rein in spending. Council told staff to reflect on the use of consultants. And instead of using this as a chance of reflection, on past spending and hiring, CEO Vare, you just rubber stamped and defended all the spending and hiring with this report. Out of roughly $11 million and hundreds of consulting contracts given out, I find it hard to believe that you could not find one that didn't align with best practices or required more scrutiny. Fellow counselors, this report discards us and our constituents we represent. This completely ignores the whole democratic process because this report is evidence that staff is working against council and suites. They were, they were directed by council to make consulting a line item in the budget and they ignored it. And instead we are just accepting it as information. Thank you. Councilor Kinnick, um, they actually 
weren't directed to uh, make consulting a line item in the budget. Uh, they asked, we asked them to develop a plan to make consulting fees a line item in the budget within each department, and that we asked them to re uh, report by the end of Q1, summarize the purposes for which each of the city's 10 main service areas used consultants. Both of those were done. The report that came back from Mr. Ver explained, I think rather clearly, why um, it would be difficult to separate those out. Now it is separated out in a couple specific instances where the use of consultants is prevalent, like in engineering. Uh, but uh, if you specifically wanted staff to uh, make consulting fees a line item within the budget, you could bring a motion that directs specifically that to happen and have council vote on that um, proposal. It may or may not um, pass. If it does, CAO Bear and the rest of the administration would have no choice but to do that. We've got that authority, but that is not what we approved from, from the last resolution. Um, and to suggest that council is working against uh, sorry, the staff is working against councils, frankly, um, beyond the pale. And uh, there is a, a, a great team of dedicated employees here. We we don't always agree with them. I and Mr. Bear have had significant disagreement uh, over uh, uh, the downtown plaza as one example in the past. Uh, but I know that in every recommendation he's brought forward, he is doing as council directed him to do, which was to bring forward proposals on the development uh, of that project. The majority of council uh, approved that. And had they at any point said to stop, he would have stopped and worked on other priorities that council had directed him to, uh, as would every person around this table. So um, you will definitely get further working with staff to try and achieve the goals that you want than you will by, uh, you know, frankly, giving them a tongue lashing um, because the report doesn't align exactly with what you uh, think it ought to align with. So uh, we are here to vote on these things. If you wish to uh, have it be more direct and more uh, refined, I welcome you to seek a seconder to to bring that future motion uh, but to suggest that the report wasn't responded to in the way that it was requested to be responded to is is untrue and uh, to suggest that our dedicated team here is not working in the best interest of the community is also untrue um so uh unless any other counselor has questions or comments on seven point what is that six five Councillor Vezuel. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I just would like to make a comment that in a corporation of any size, especially a corporation such as the City of Sault Ste. Marie, we also have an obligatory requirement to have outside consultants, such as our audit. That is a requirement that we have to bring in audit services to the city at a cost. Ms. Shell cannot audit her own work or that of her staff it has to be done by an outside auditor. I would also like to point out, um, especially for the people watching and looking at the report, a lot of these um, expenses, such as the arts and culture strategy, that was brought forth due to a funding. I believe it was NOHFC and a couple other funders. So quite often we get grants for studies and that is the requirement of the grant. Staff does not have any leeway on how that is going to be spent. And it's done because, no, we don't have someone here that's like from the Lord's Consulting Group that can take a look at an inventory of our entire arts and culture and make recommendations. It's really important when you're trying to create change and have efficiencies and improvements that you have an impartial third party. And in terms of legal, I believe it was either last year or the year before in budget that there was a request for an additional person in legal. That was not given. So Ms. Fields, to do that, the work that she needs to do in her legal department, sometimes has to get outside counsel because no one is available within the realm of the city to do it. 
it's all about working together. And what I would um, say to my colleague is that being accusatory when maybe you don't understand the entirety of the, um, the I guess, the sense of why and when and where and how, I think probably having a one-on-one -on -one conversation or understanding better why there are consultants and why they're not would be much better served than having that accusatory tone. And I certainly support the report. I think it gives us all a look at all the work that we have done from 2019 to 2022. I think it's amazing how much that has happened in these past few years. And I wanna thank staff for their continued work and finding innovative ways to get funding for consultants and have studies so that we can provide better services for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vezuelan, Councillor Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I just have a few comments about the report. Uh, I thought that um, it's it's very easy to get caught up in uh, you know what is spent and um, thinking that perhaps someone internally could do things better. Maybe we could save money here or there. Um, something that would be interesting to see is how much money has been pulled in uh, due to the spending, uh, you know, of council on these consultants. Sometimes there are just things that our staff cannot do. Um, so I, I was happy to see the report. I did note that, um, um, Mr. Ver put in here hiring of specialists, who regularly work in these fields also minimizes corporations risk. Um, so that's appreciated as well. Um, but I did wonder, Mr. Vare, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to Mr. Vare, um, of that approximate $11 million um, in, in consultant spending, um, in doing any of this, or sorry, in doing this report, um, do you see any place where Perhaps it would be worth the cost to hire um, someone in any of these fields. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Caputo, certainly um, would say at the at the outset that uh, staff takes the resolution from uh, council very seriously in the way we approach reporting back to council on the use of consultants. I think the um, the use of consultants will follow our procurement processes. And so council will see when we engage consultants and how we engage consultants and for what we are engaging those consultants for. And then council will approve the contracts for those consultants as they come up throughout the year. Um, as we mentioned in the report, there are a number of ways that we engage consultants and staff don't take lightly the use of consultants or the spending of city funds and anything that we do. And so Number one, if we employ specialized staff that aren't required as full-time employees, um, to your question, Councillor Caputo, we didn't uncover areas that we said, um, you know, we think we have an opportunity right now to hire a full-time consultant, um, or sorry, a full-time employee to replace this use of consultant. Um, but that's something we would continue to monitor in our budgeting and certainly bring forward to Council uh, when we do see those opportunities. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, I just wanted to say thank you for the report. Um, I am confident in uh, staff's ability um, and in in the asks that uh, you're bringing forward. I also would like to note that it, you know, as you said, Mr. Vare, it is up to us ultimately as council whether we uh, approve these requests for consultants. So uh, we do get a say in in pretty much every single one. Um, so I just, um, yeah, I, I think, um, I think my colleague was a little out of line in calling staff out in this way, but, um, I am personally happy with the way that things have been going since I've been on council. So, uh, thanks again. Anyone else on council comments on 7.5? Okay. Seeing none, this, uh, be received as in I have a motion by Councillor Zagordo and Spina resolved that the report of the Chief Administrative Officer dated March 18, 2024, concerning the use of consultants for city operations be received as information. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries. I 
have all in favor except for Councillor Kinnick. Just to 716. Councillor Kinnick, you uh, pulled this from consent as well, so I'll offer you the opportunity to speak on it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, this was process of downtown revitalization project started in the summer of 2023. I was strongly opposed to this, uh, <laughs> where we approved the $6 million uh, that we for the phase one of the revitalization project. Now with this report, uh, staff is asking us to cover any cost overruns associated with the project from $6 million. So right off the bat here, we, in the summer that was was agreed to was $6 million, cut back the project if something was going to be over $6 million. Now we are being asked already, before anything started, to cover costs over $6 million. So thank you. This is why I'm going to be against this. Thank you. I, I think that's that's actually slightly off. The, so we approved the project to not exceed $6 million. Um, and but but staff have made an application to NOHFC for two million. NOHFC has said, "Well, you're past the preliminary stage, but if we give you the two million, you have to cover cost overruns over two million. So um, the, the reason have had to pass um, approvals like this in the past is so that uh, municipal councils don't go back to NOHFC and say, you know, we went over our budget of two million that you gave to us. Can you cover it? Um, but in my view, and Council Mr. Vera can uh, confirm this, um, the city will not be spending more than six million on this project, regardless of this kind of backstop that NOHFC requires. Is that accurate? To you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, to Councillor Kinnick, yes, uh, this requirement is one of NOHFC for any project that they fund. They ask the uh, board or the council uh, for the project to pass a motion or resolution indicating they uh, will cover any cost overruns. And so it is, as the mayor says, a way for them to ensure that the applicants don't come back to them to ask for more funding, that it's upfront that the project proponent agrees that they would cover any cost overruns. And that's why we're asking for this tonight. But is it accurate, Mr. Bear, that the city's costs would, based on the council approval, not exceed $6 million? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. And certainly, I guess if we had to come back to council to increase the cost of the project, we would have to do that and see if council wanted to approve it. We have the uh, the approval of council of six million, and and that's the cost that we'll be working within a staff. Any other councillors have questions or comments? Or Councillor Kinnick, did you have anything beyond that? Okay. Um, any other councillors with questions or comments on that? Councillor Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to say thank you to staff for putting forward this application to NOHFC. And uh, it is my hope that it gets approved and we will be even uh, under the six million that we have uh, allotted to the project. Um, so uh, thank you to staff for doing so and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing the first parts of this revitalization get underway. Any other councillors with questions or comments on that? Seeing none. I have a motion by councillors Zagordo and Hollingsworth resolved that the report of the Director of Tourism and Community Development dated March 18, 2024 be received and that council approve an application to Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation for the Downtown Business District Revitalization Project, Queen Street Reconstruction, and confirms the city contribution of $6 million from the 2024 Capital Roads Budget. Further, that the Corporation of the City of Sault Ste. Marie commits to cover any project cost overruns if they are incurred. All in favor? Any opposed? And I have all in favor except Councillor King. Correct. That will bring us to 9.1, advertising opportunities to reduce future tax increases. I have a motion by Councillor Spina and Hollingsworth 
whereas the city of Sault Ste. Marie maintains benches, garbage can signs, other permanent structures, and clear areas on the hub trail and throughout the city, and whereas these structures and areas are available to be used for advertising opportunities that can generate revenue for the city of Sault Ste. Marie, and whereas the revenue generated can be used to maintain the areas of the hub trail and other walkways or build new infrastructure, and whereas such revenues can be used to reduce or eliminate future tax increases, and whereas the city must look at every opportunity to generate new revenues that can offset future municipal tax increases. Now, therefore, be it resolved that staff be requested to investigate the ability for these structure, objects, and areas to be used as advertising revenue generating tools, and that staff report on any restrictions to the implementation of this policy, such as restricting the creation of any structure that may obstruct views, and restricting any advertisements on the waterfront, and that the revenue generated from such advertising be used for hub trail maintenance, the maintenance of other walkways, and the development of new such trails or walkways in order to reduce any future municipal tax increases. Councillor Spina. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, before we chat about this one, I want to I want to uh, give a thank you to uh, Tony Spadafore, constituent who I had a great conversation with about this particular item. He had some really, really great uh, ideas and thoughts, and uh, I'm happy to uh, include a lot of that in what we're talking about here today. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, 2019 Councillor Shoemaker, who uh, I think uh, attempted to do something similar to this back then. You know, we, we have this uh, great uh, infrastructure all around the community where there is uh, unequivocally a, a captive audience that can uh, see and interact with any kind of advertising that, that we may put in place. Uh, these are great opportunities for us and for businesses to not only advertise their business, but generate conversations around the community. It's also a great opportunity for us to develop funds to go back into our system to pay for the maintenance of these types of things and pay for the maintenance of fields of of uh, walkways of trail systems of all of those things that we're spending a lot of money from the levy on to maintain and it's a way for a great way for us to offset the levy and keep taxes down and keep taxes as low as possible uh, for our community at the exact same time uh, it's a win-win for absolutely everybody involved and i think there can be i know there can be great uh, restrictions put in place that would uh, really in, ensure that we keep the beauty of the area, keep the beauty of things like the waterfront, things like bridges on the hub trail so that we're not interfering with any of those views. Uh, and I think we can get really, really creative with this uh, from a staff perspective. Um, we've had some great preliminary conversations and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes from there and seeing actually just how far we can reduce uh, taxes paid by constituents here in the city by implementing a project like this. Councillor Spina, Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Spina summarized it very well. And I just want to say I'm glad he brought this to the table and I'm happy to be his seconder. And uh, we use advertising opportunities all throughout the city currently. And our GFL arena is one example. And so it's not like this is um, nothing brand new. It's just another way, another revenue envelope. So thank you, Councillor Spina. It was well written. Any other councillors with comments on 9.1? I would just note that in 2019, uh, when this motion was, or when a similar type motion was before council, I commented on how effective they are because there was a uh, transit bench in London, every transit bench in London, it seemed at the time, had George Georgopoulos on it. And the name has always stuck with me because of those uh, transit benches. Um, and uh, so advertising like this works. And we can, if we can generate some revenue from it, uh, all the better for the city taxpayer. So with that, I can call the vote on the matter. All in favor? Opposed? That carries. And item 9.2, Boulevard Gardens. I do have a seconder uh, as Councillor Gardy, so I'll need... Um... And a motion by Councillors Vezo Allen and Hollingsworth, whereas the City of Sault Ste. Marie deems it necessary to regulate the maintenance and use of the boulevard portion of highways under its jurisdiction, 
And whereas the city of Sault Ste. Marie is committed to promoting environmental sustainability as outlined in its strategic plan and greenhouse gas reduction plan, and whereas Boulevard Gardens can help beautify streetscape and well-chosen non-invasive plants that are designed to retain moisture can reduce water usage and the need to use mowers and fertilizer, improving the health of our ecosystem. And whereas a key responsibility of the city's Environmental Sustainability Committee is to assist in formulating and recommending environmental and sustainability policies. And whereas various horticulture and environmental groups have expressed an interest in Boulevard Gardens, and where, whereas Boulevard Gardens can help beautify the streetscapes and attract pollinators to the area, improving urban ecosystems. And whereas communities such as Barrie, Guelph, Caledon, and others have developed Boulevard Garden guidelines and policies. And whereas there is a desire to support Boulevard Gardens, now therefore be it resolved that Council request appropriate departments to work with the Environmental Sustainability Committee in developing a revised bylaw to support Boulevard Gardens in the community. So it goes on. Thank you so much. I was really um, fortunate to be included with this group and working with them. So it certainly wasn't my work. It was the work of a quite a diverse group of folks um, from the Horticultural Society, Clean North, Sioux Naturalist, Sioux Climate Hub. We had a volunteer from the David Suzuki Foundation, New North Greenhouses. And uh, I want to really thank Emily Cormier, our sustainability coordinator who's not here, but who chaired all the meetings and got everyone on the same page and, and got us uh, to where we are tonight. So thank you. I also want to thank Susan and Larry and Travis. We had a pre-meeting before the, the resolution to make sure that um, Public Works was on board, bylaw and legal to make sure that it was something that we could do. And uh, I learned a lot and uh, I'm really excited about it. And from the amount of emails that uh, I've received this past week. It's been really wonderful. Also on the Clean North site, they have a Grow Me Guide. So everything's available um, for people that are interested in Boulevard Gardens. And I know both the Horticultural Society and Clean North and the Sioux Naturalists have a plan to um, help people and move this forward. So I just wanna thank staff's time too um, and really being open about it and uh, I know Councillor Gardy can't be here, but he's part of the um, Sustainability Committee. So I also want to thank everyone that's on that committee as well. Thank you, Councillor Pezuelan. Uh Councillor Gardy was the seconder, but Councillor Hollingsworth, did you have anything to add? Um, basically, it's just a wonderful idea. And this um, also goes with what Montreal has been doing. And as you may recall, a couple months ago, they had an environmental conference and they've been promoting sponge gardens. And uh, so they've been trying to basically encourage municipalities to have these sponge gardens with different plants so that the moisture is soaked in and the moisture is not run off on asphalt. So if I may say to my counterpart, well done to you and the entire team um, is very um, up and coming and once again, environmentally friendly. So well done. Thank you. Any other councillors? Councillor Spina? Thank you, Councilor Bernie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick comment. Uh, I will echo what uh, Councilor Vezo Allen said. I did receive a lot of uh, emails, as I'm sure many other councillors have as well, uh, urging uh, me to support this motion tonight. And, uh, and specifically, Ted and Barbara, Abby, Carly, Linda, Al, Emily. I mean, the list goes on and on. I got a lot of emails and calls from a lot of folks. Uh, so happy to support tonight. And uh, thanks for bringing it forward. Thank you, Councilor Spina. Councilor Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will support this uh, this evening, but my question goes to the committee and maybe Mr. Bear might be able to answer. Um, they're going to come back with a revised bylaw uh, to support the Boulevard Gardens in the community. Will they come back with, say, what negative factors if, uh, Boulevard Gardens are um, installed in their city? And the reason why I ask is, I'm a little bit confused here. If if the resident or people, taxpayers, take care of the gardens, what happens when they don't? Whose responsibility will it be after? And will they come back with, uh, with that? Like, uh, is it going to be public works? Uh, is that extra cost uh, to our public works? But I hope the committee comes back to have some type of game plan that if these gardens aren't uh, taken care of, uh, who will take care of them? 
Mr. Hamilton Beach. You, Mr. Mayor to Councillor Bruni. Yes, the, this bylaw, which we are excited about and certainly look to have the, the Boulevard Gardens um, of, able to be developed, there will be restrictions such as setbacks, such as the height of the grass, similar to what other municipalities are, are also doing. And, and with the framework being a bylaw, that will be enforceable and thus putting that maintenance on the resident. Fair enough. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Caputo? Sorry, was that it, Councilor Bruni? Yes, okay. Sorry, Councilor Caputo. Oh, that's okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to reach out and say um, uh, that I appreciated getting so many um, emails and DMs on Instagram from uh, folks who were really excited about this project. Um, when I first read about it, I was a little skeptical. I mean, just because... Uh, you know, it's a new thing and um, you worry about rodents and insects and all types of stuff. Um, but getting the encouraging words from residents who were very excited about it uh, was really great. Um, I love seeing folks being involved in our municipal uh, government. So thank you to everyone who sent any messages um, to my way. Um I just wanted to add that I would like to uh, see when we get this information back um, on new builds. Uh, someone had raised a question about um, will developers be able to leave the boulevards bare now? That was a concern uh, rather, you know, so that constituents can do whatever they want with their garden boulevard. Um, will bylaws still stand uh, where things have to be sodded? Um, and, and I know these are all things that staff will look into and will be included in the report, uh, but just a few concerns from uh, residents. But all in all, I'm really excited to support this. Thank you, Councillor Caputo. Councillor Dufour, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, just really quick, just wanted to reiterate uh, some of Councillor Bruni's comments. I'm really looking forward to seeing a bylaw that does help to uh, really delineate what a boulevard garden is and, uh, you know, make it clear that your whole yard can't be just an unmowed boulevard garden. Um, that said, I just wanted to also uh, make my regular reminder to Council that as we add bylaws that require enforceability. We always have to be mindful of how we're resourcing our bylaw enforcement. Um, that said, this is something I support. I'm looking forward to uh, just a couple of considerations. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Dufort. Any other councillors with questions or comments? Seeing none, we can have a vote on the matter. All in favor? Any opposed? That carried. We're going to accept a couple of uh, zoning bylaws, but we'll deal with the consent zoning motion first. I have a motion by Councillors Zagordo and Hollingsworth resolve that all bylaws under item 12 of the agenda under date March 18, 2024 save and accept bylaws 2024-22 and 2024-23 be approved. All in favor? That carries. With respect to bylaws 2024-22 and 2024-23, we've got Mr. DeLude here uh, who um, wishes to uh, speak on the zoning bylaws. His request to speak on the zoning bylaws was denied by the Agenda Review Committee um, because the opportunity to speak on the zoning, uh, the rezoning, was afforded at the February 20th council meeting. And if there is an opportunity afforded to speak on something uh, and it is not, uh, you don't do not use uh, or take advantage of that opportunity, then uh, the bylaw prohibits uh, coming to a future council meeting and speaking in uh, for or against that item, uh, which uh, was explained to Mr. DeLude by email uh, from the clerk last week. Mr. DeLude is here nonetheless and wishes to speak uh, in opposition, I believe, to the proposed uh, zoning amendment. Um, 
the request wasn't made by three o'clock today, which is another requirement of the procedural bylaw. However, council does have the authority to suspend the procedure bylaw to allow Mr. DeLude to speak if they wish to. And so I am providing council with the opportunity, if they wish to, to move a motion, which has to be passed by a two thirds majority to suspend the procedure bylaw to allow Mr. DeLude to speak. If there is a mover and a seconder for that, we can put it on the table. Councillor Kinnick, is there a seconder? Councillor Caputo. So this is a motion to suspend the procedural bylaw to permit Mr. DeLude the opportunity to speak on bylaws 2024-22 and 2024-23. I don't believe that it requires much debate on that unless any councillor wishes to ask questions of the suspension of the procedure bylaw. Go ahead, Councillor Dufour. Are we allowed to put a uh, a time limit on the length of suspension? We um, uh, delegations to council are um, limited to three minutes. Uh, on zoning matters, they're not. But given that this um, falls outside of the planning act that we typically sit as planning act body, we typically sit as. I believe that the time limit will be three minutes uh, on in this occasion if there's a motion to suspend the bylaw. So thank you. Any other questions, Council? Okay. Uh, all in favor of suspending the uh, procedure bylaw to allow Mr. Delude the opportunity to speak? That carries by more than a two thirds majority. That was everybody. Um, so, Mr. Delude. The uh, red microphone next to you is on. You've got three minutes, only three minutes. Dan Delude, 553 Black Dirt Road. And I'd like to comment on the rezoning or the, the zoning change. And I'd like to say this. Uh, 20 years ago, it was rezoned from rural, residential, to M1 uh, industrial, whatever, light industrial. And at that time, I got the impression at the meeting, at the, at the meeting, I think, that they were insincere about their uh, approach to this. My property zoning got changed, and I did not think it was appropriate. There was something fishy about it. But here's the deal now. In in Canada and in Ontario, there's very specific property rights afforded to a person. Very specific. There's no gray area. So that being said, uh, as far as I'm concerned, my opinion, I've been through 20 years of torture. Torturing my property. And I will not sit by idly and watch my neighbors be treated the same. I will not. And with that being said, sir, uh, my human rights, you've taught my human rights. Your basic human rights to the right to enjoy your property has been removed. Now, you can vote whatever you want. I, you know, it's not up to me. You will do what you got to do. But just understand, this is not done. I'm seeking legal counsel to bring it back. The city over here to understand what you're doing because I don't think you really understand. And with that, thank you, Mr. Council, any questions on zoning bylaw 2024 22 or 2024 23? Seeing none, we can vote on those, clerk. On agenda item 12.1.2, bylaw 2024-22, I have a motion by Councillors Caputo and Hollingsworth resolved that bylaw 2024-22 being a bylaw to amend Sault Ste. Marie zoning bylaws 2005-150 and 2005-151 concerning lands located at 537 Black Road be passed in open council this 18th day of March 2024. All in favor? Any opposed? 
And agenda item 12.1.3 bylaw 2024-23. I have a motion by Councillors Caputo and Hollingsworth resolved that bylaw 2024-23 being a bylaw to designate the lands located at 537 Black Road, an area of site plan control, be passed in this open council, sorry, be passed in open council this 18th day of March 2020. All in favor. Opposed? Not carried. We do have third reading bylaws that didn't get captured under the consent. So I'll just do those really quickly. Okay. Oh, I lied. They did. We're moving on. <laughs> just didn't want to forget them. <laughs> so we'll have to move us to closed session motion. And I have a motion by Councillors Caputo and Hollingsworth resolved that this council move into closed session to discuss one item concerning security of property of the municipality, one item concerning two identifiable individuals, two items concerning the proposed acquisition of land, two items concerning the proposed disposition of land, and two items subject to solicitor client privilege. Further be it resolved that should the said closed session be adjourned, the council may reconvene in closed session to continue to discuss the same matters without the need for a further authorizing resolution. All in favor? That carries. And I have a motion by Councillor Zagordo and oh, Councillor Spina has left. Councillor Zagordo and Councillor Dufour. Okay. Uh, I have a motion by Councillor Zagordo and Dufour resolved that this council now adjourn. All in favor? That carries.